So what's the best magnesium supplement for your health? Well, there are lots of forms to choose from, and the best one really depends on what you're trying to achieve or it depends on your underlying conditions. And some of you may actually benefit from taking several different forms of magnesium together to fully optimize your health. Because it's so important to get it right, as proper magnesium stores are crucial for every aspect of your health. From neurological health, to heart health, your metabolism, digestion, sleep, anti-aging, and even cancer prevention. So in this video, I'll tell you exactly which forms of magnesium is best for your individual needs and I'll also tell you the biggest mistakes people make with magnesium and how to avoid them. And at the end of the video, I'll tell you which brands I personally take and recommend to my patients. I'm Dr. Leonid Kim. I am board certified in internal and obesity medicine. And on this channel, I discuss the most up-to-date and evidence-based information on the topics of weight loss, metabolic health, and longevity. Let's get into it. So let's start with one of the most popular forms of magnesium, and that is magnesium glycinate. It's formulated by binding elemental magnesium and the amino acid glycine. And amino acids like glycine are the building blocks of protein, and they're usually found in meats, bone broth, fish, uh, dairy. Now the reason magnesium glycinate is so popular is because it's very bioavailable. Or in other words, it's very easily absorbed and a large portion of it can enter the bloodstream and be utilized by your body. And because it's absorbed in many different areas of your intestine, it does not give you as many gastrointestinal side effects like diarrhea as other forms of magnesium, like magnesium oxide or sulfate, which I'll cover later in this video. Now, magnesium glycinate has been associated with many different health benefits. Most notable is in the improvement of depression, anxiety, and sleep. But unfortunately, I couldn't find many good quality studies that tested magnesium glycinate specifically. But there was a small case study that showed that magnesium glycinate could be helpful in improving symptoms of depression, which mechanistically does make sense as magnesium deficiency is very common among people with depression. Another important reason I usually recommend magnesium glycinate is to help with vitamin D absorption. Magnesium is a very important enzyme in vitamin D metabolism. It serves as a crucial step in taking the inactive form of vitamin D that we get from food or supplements, and magnesium converts it into a more biologically active form of vitamin D, like 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is the form that is usually measured on a blood test. And there was a double-blind, randomized controlled trial that showed that in people with overweight or obesity, adding magnesium glycinate to vitamin D is more effective in raising vitamin D levels compared to vitamin D supplementation alone. Now, one important thing to note when taking the right magnesium glycinate supplement is to pick the brand that has a chelated form of magnesium or a form where magnesium and glycine are chemically bonded to each other, which transforms inorganic metallic element into a biological form that is better absorbed. Now, many brands use misleading and inaccurate labeling, and instead of chelated or chemically bonded magnesium, what they sell is blended forms of glycine with a cheaper form of magnesium, like magnesium oxide or magnesium carbonate, which is a form of magnesium that is not as well absorbed and it's more likely to give you diarrhea. So there was a quality test performed by NOW, published in December of 2022, that found that most magnesium glycinate products found on Amazon did not actually provide truly chelated forms of magnesium. But what was sold was a cheaper form that is blended and not chemically bonded. And not surprising, but the NOW magnesium supplement did pretty well in their own funded study. So take it for what it's worth. And by the way, if you are currently taking the magnesium supplement, let me know in the comments which magnesium supplement that you prefer and tell me why. Because I have my favorite brands, but I'm always looking to learn more about other brands. Next, let's talk about magnesium citrate. And just like magnesium glycinate, it's also pretty well absorbed in the body. But at higher doses, magnesium citrate does become a laxative. In a really high doses, it's often used in bowel preparation before colonoscopies. Magnesium citrate is made out of magnesium bound with citric acid ions and citric acid is commonly found in citrus fruits like lemons and limes. And just like other forms of magnesium, magnesium citrate is reported to be helpful with anxiety. But we also have studies that show that magnesium citrate can help with metabolic syndrome, specifically blood pressure and insulin resistance. And there was a very small pilot study that was a double-blind, randomized controlled trial published in 2021 that showed that supplementation with 400 milligrams of magnesium citrate daily for 12 weeks led to a significant decrease in blood pressure, 
as well as a significant improvement in hemoglobin A1c. Next, we need to talk about magnesium L3 N8, or MAGTEAM. It's been getting a lot of attention lately because of its potential impact on brain function, especially memory loss and cognition, as well as because of its potential use in chronic pain. Now, magnesium levels are very tightly regulated in our bodies, and very little of the magnesium in our blood can actually cross the blood-brain barrier, which, just as the name suggests, is a membrane between the blood and the brain. So in general, very little magnesium that is ingested is actually transported to our brain or the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is where magnesium L3 and 8 comes in. There's animal data that suggests that magnesium 3 and 8 can easily cross the blood-brain barrier, and it can do so due to its unique chemical structure, where magnesium that is bonded with thyronic acid, which is a metabolite vitamin C, and the structure is what enables it to pass through the barrier and achieve higher concentration of magnesium in the brain. Now, a lot of the excitement is based on small animal studies done in mice and rats, where some studies showed improved memory, improved motor function in Parkinson's models, and some studies showed reduced brain inflammation. But it's hard to draw any kind of conclusions based on animal studies, as many of those don't really translate to human trials. Now, we do have small human studies that can give us a little bit more insight. And the initial study that put magnesium 3 and 8 on the map was a small, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, but with only 44 participants, ages between 50 to 70, with self-reported complaints of impaired memory or concentration. And the group that took magnesium 3 and 8 was found to have a very small, possibly clinically significant improvement in executive function and in working memory. In a more recent study published in 2022, was a larger study with 109 participants that was also a double-blind, placebo-controlled study that showed that treatment with 400 milligrams of magnesium 3 and 8, along with vitamin B6, vitamin C, vitamin D3, and phosphatidylserine significantly improved performance in cognition and memory, with the older participants showing more improvement than younger participants. But it's hard to draw any conclusions from this study as we don't know whether it was the magnesium 3 and 8 or the other vitamins, or phosphatidylserine, or the combination of some sorts that was responsible for the improved condition. And another important asterisk for both of those studies is that they were both industry funded, so there may be potential conflict of interest. The overall totality of evidence for the benefits of magnesium 3 and 8 is pretty underwhelming at this point, so this is not one of the supplements I generally recommend to my patients especially considering its high cost. Also, it'd be very hard to meet your daily magnesium needs with a supplement, as it contains very little elemental magnesium. So if you are taking magnesium 3 and 8, I would not count it towards calculating your recommended daily allowance. By the way, trying to figure out how much magnesium to take, or your optimal levels of magnesium, or how to know if you're actually deficient in magnesium to begin with, is a huge topic in and of itself and I will be releasing a video on that soon, so stay tuned for that. Next up is a form of magnesium that's been getting a lot of excitement, and that is magnesium taurate. Now, this form of magnesium is also pretty well absorbed, and it contains the amino acid taurine, which is a protein building block that is usually found in clams, shellfish, and poultry. Taurine has been reported to be beneficial in the treatment of high blood pressure, obesity, and high cholesterol, and some studies speculate it even has anti-aging effects. There are some animal studies that show that magnesium taurate can help with high blood pressure, as well as having neuroprotective properties in the setting of traumatic brain injury. But unfortunately, the current evidence is mostly based on animal data, and we do need larger human studies before I can recommend it with more confidence. Next, let's talk about magnesium sulfate, which is formed by combining magnesium, sulfur, and oxygen. Magnesium sulfate is commonly known as Epsom salt. It is often used as a laxative, and many people take Epsom baths to help with muscle cramps or as a way to relax. But there's not enough evidence to say that Epsom baths can effectively penetrate the skin, or if they can be absorbed transdermally to actually increase your body magnesium levels. But anecdotally, many of my patients do find Epsom baths very relaxing, and if that's the case, that could be an added benefit even if it doesn't raise your magnesium levels. Next up is magnesium malate, which is a compound made of magnesium and malic acid. Now, malic acid is usually found in fruit or wine, and this form of magnesium is very well absorbed and probably the easiest to tolerate due to a much less relaxative effect. This is the magnesium I recommend to my patients who have not been able to tolerate other forms of magnesium due to GI upset. By the way, there's also studies that show that magnesium malate can be helpful in the treatment of fibromyalgia, but that's a big topic for another day. Next up is magnesium chloride, 
which is another magnesium that is very efficiently and easily absorbed. It's reported to be useful in the treatment of depression. And in fact, there was an open label, randomized control crossover trial that showed that treatment with 248 milligrams of magnesium chloride for six weeks resulted in clinically significant improvements in depression and anxiety scores. Magnesium chloride is also often used as a topical agent for muscle soreness, but just like with magnesium sulfate, there's just not enough evidence to say if it has any clinical benefit or if it's even absorbed through your skin. And last but not least, there's magnesium oxide, which is the cheapest and most common form of magnesium you can find. It's an inorganic form of magnesium that is poorly absorbed by a GI tract. So it really should not be used to treat magnesium deficiency. Where magnesium oxide shines is in the treatment of constipation. And I want to highlight a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology that showed that magnesium oxide was just as effective as Senna, a common constipation drug, in improving the frequency of bowel movements and improving the constipation quality of life scores. There's also some early evidence showing that magnesium oxide could be effective in preventing migraines and is based on the small study from 2019 that was a double-blind, randomized crossover trial that showed that treatment with 500 milligrams of magnesium oxide was just as effective in migraine prophylaxis as treatment with velprobed sodium or Depakote. Now, this is a very brief overview of the most common forms of magnesium that we usually take. But if there's one form you'd like for me to go more in depth on, or if there's a form I did not talk about, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a separate video on that in the future.